Good morning. Today's uh, sermon reading is going to be from uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 4 through 10. Um, let's please stand for the reading of God's word. And remain standing for the prayer as well. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For he stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, to whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were dis destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a ho holy nation, people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege and honor it is, Lord, that we can come before you and praise your holy name. Lord God, we are here because we are hungry for you. We are hungry for your word that is forever transforming. And Father God, right now, we need to be transformed. We need to be transformed, Lord, wherever we are, wherever we are in our walk with you, Lord, we need to change. And I just pray, Lord God, um, that you would uh, be with us, uh, be with Ada, Lord, as he speaks. I pray, Lord, that you would fill him with your spirit. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to each and every one of us personally, Lord. You, all of us are going through different trials and challenges, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we'd bring that to you and trust in you, Lord. We love you and we pray all these things in your son's name. The key idea from the passage this morning is that what we do with Jesus, it changes the character of our lives and it determines our destiny. How we respond to Jesus, what we do with him, it changes our lives today, tomorrow, and it also determines our destiny forever. Peter in this passage describes Jesus as a stone. And what he tells us is that we can build our lives on Jesus, on this stone, or we can reject Jesus. And if we reject him, we'll stumble over this stone, and ultimately, we'll fall. I'm trying to build my life on Jesus. That's my effort. I'm trying to make him my foundation. And what that involves is obeying his teaching. And when you obey Jesus' teaching, not all the time, but sometimes you'll experience rejection for that. You'll be rejected for obeying Him. A few weeks ago, I was visiting a friend of mine, a good friend of mine. He's an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. He's a very intelligent, charismatic, attractive person. And I've looked up to him for many, many years. He started asking me questions about my faith, about my discipleship. He was asking what it's like, why I do it. He was asking about some of the behaviors I've chosen to adopt because of Jesus' teaching, or some things that I don't do because of Jesus' teaching. And there came a point in our conversation, he started asking about sexuality. He was asking about lust and sex, and I was introducing him to Jesus' teachings about lust, where Jesus teaches people not only not to engage in certain kinds of sex, but he teaches them, don't even lust after people that you're not married to. Don't even desire them in your heart. And he was asking questions because he'd never heard this before. He was asking, like, why and how does that work? And I was doing my best to explain to him. And there came a point where he just looked at me and he said, that's crazy. 
And it was not, I mean, he wasn't joking, you know, it was a friendly conversation, but he said, that's crazy. And he actually put a swear word in there. Um, and I told you guys, I look up to this person a lot. I've looked up to him for many years. And to be honest, that shook me a little bit. And when he said, that's crazy, I started thinking, and it worked on me for a few days, like, is it crazy? Is this life that I'm living, these different ways in which I'm denying myself, is that crazy? Like, am I out of touch with reality? And that happens. I'm looking up to him. I admire his life. I admire him. He challenges, and I think, am I crazy? Peter was trying to offer encouragement and comfort to people who were having experiences like this. And not just like the one I had, but much more serious experiences of rejection. In this letter that we've been looking at, Peter was writing to people who were being criticized and mocked for their association with Jesus. There's different points in the letter. You can see that they were being rejected in this way, and it was bothering them. And the way that he starts this passage at verse 4, he says, As you come to Jesus, and look at how he describes Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. So just in this description, Peter, he's trying to encourage and support these people, these early followers of Jesus. He's saying, look, if you're experiencing rejection by other people, don't be discouraged, don't be surprised, because Jesus experienced the same sort of rejection. He was rejected by others. But this didn't for a moment change the fact that he was chosen by God and precious to God. And this is true of you too. You are chosen by God and precious to God. And I needed that. That day that I was sitting with my friend and I was getting thrown off and questioning, it would have helped me to have someone remind me, Ada, you're precious to God. It's okay if this person that you respect and look up to is rejecting you on some level because you are precious to God. And what I experienced, not a huge instance of rejection, but as I was preparing this week, I was asking friends of mine, have you experienced rejection for your trust in Jesus, for your association with him? And, and I was talking to two guys specifically who came to Jesus in their 20s. And one of them was telling me that when he came to Jesus, for three months, his brother refused to talk to him. Three months. Another one told me that his best friend didn't invite him on this yearly trip that they would take with their group of friends. And imagine how hurtful that sort of rejection is. You, you find the greatest thing in the world, Jesus. You give your life to him. You're experiencing the joy of transformation. And then these people that you love, your family and your friends, they start rejecting you. So Peter is trying to encourage people with this word. And what would have helped me, and what would have helped these, these two guys I'm telling you about, is to hear what Peter says later in the passage. He's addressing the group as a whole. He says, you are a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And listen to this encouragement. You are a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Not only do you have this privilege of being chosen by God, you have this privilege responsibility of declaring his praise and showing how beautiful and excellent he is. Now, Peter, in his attempts to encourage these early followers of Jesus, he ends up saying surprising things. And these two things that I just covered, that Jesus was rejected, and that these people Peter was writing to were chosen by God to proclaim his greatness, both of these things are actually very surprising. Sometimes we, we read the Bible, and it's hard for us to understand everything that's going on in what we're reading. You know, Jesus was rejected. Okay, I got that. Okay, these people that Peter was writing to, they were chosen. I got that. And you move on. 
But actually what's really surprising about both of these things is that Peter didn't believe either of these things before. He didn't believe that the Messiah should be rejected. And he also didn't believe that the people he was writing to could possibly be God's chosen people. So I want you to be confused by that. And I want you to understand that these are kind of surprising things to say. Let's start with, with the latter thing, that these people that Peter was writing to are God's chosen people. What Peter is doing when he gives all these titles to these people he's writing to, he's alluding to the scriptures of Israel, what we call the Old Testament. And the first thing he's referring to is something in the book of Exodus and just listen, I'm going to read to you what God tells Moses to tell Israel. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And look what God says to Moses. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Another passage that Peter is alluding to is Isaiah 43. Again, this is God speaking. I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. Peter is referring to these two passages. And What's happening in these passages, what we're seeing is that God chose Israel. Specifically, among all nations, He chose Israel. He formed them to be holy. And He called them and said, Obey me, and if you do, you will be a special nation. My love will be on you. And you will become so good, and you will become so strong and beautiful that all the nations of the world will see you, and they'll come to praise me because of that. That was the special call on Israel. And what makes the fact that Peter refers to these titles and these responsibilities so surprising is that Peter is writing to non-Jews. He's actually writing these words, he's giving these titles and claiming these privileges and responsibilities for early followers of Jesus who were Gentiles not Jews. So we have to wonder what happened. This is so surprising because you have to imagine Peter, he's like a young child and he's growing up to be a young man in the first century as a Jew. And he's going to synagogue. The synagogue was the local place where people would come to worship God. And he's going there and he's hearing these passages that I just read from Exodus and Isaiah, he's hearing them and he's slowly realizing, wow, I'm so lucky. I was born as a member of a special race. Not just any nation, but a nation that God chose. And slowly, as a teenager, I'm sure, as a young man, his identity is coming into shape and he's becoming amazed at his privilege. And these sorts of ideas that we were chosen by God to be a special nation, they were deep in the hearts and minds of any first century Jew, anyone like Peter. And not only did they think we're a special nation, they actually went beyond that to something that God hadn't said, which was they started thinking we're better than everyone else. We're superior to everyone else. This was something that many first century Jews shared. And not only that, they had another, another common idea. They were expecting the Messiah to show up. They had read all of their scriptures and they knew that someone was coming who was going to take the throne of Israel, was going to defeat Rome, and was going to basically raise Israel to the top of the world. They were just waiting for that day and looking for a Messiah. Peter, at some point in his life, he met Jesus, and Jesus told him, follow me. 
And Peter had seen enough of Jesus. He'd heard his speaking, his teaching. He'd seen him do a miracle, a great catch of fish. You may know the story. And he said, you know what? I'm not sure who this guy is. He wasn't ready to say, this is the Messiah. But he was ready to say, I'm going to follow him. So Peter starts following Jesus. The guy who wrote this letter that we're looking at, the guy who wrote this passage we're looking at, he started following Jesus. And even though he wasn't sure at first, there came a point that Peter became convinced this guy, Jesus, my teacher, my friend, is actually the Messiah. There's a scene in the Gospels where Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, who do people say that I am? And they respond, they give a few possibilities, you know, the second coming of John the Baptist, the second coming of Jeremiah, stuff like that. And then he asks a much more personal question. He asks, who do you say that I am? And apparently by this point, Peter had become convinced, and he just declares it out, and he's so happy to do it. You are the Christ, which means Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You have to imagine, again, what Peter is feeling when he says this. He's come to the point that he believes his master, his teacher, his close friend, is not only going to be king of Israel, but he's going to be king of the world. And he's not just thinking that, he's thinking, Jesus is going to become king of the world, and I'm one of his closest friends. I'm going to be part of that revolution. I'm going to be part of his new government. And he knows the prophecy. His government, there's going to be no end to its increase. And Peter's thinking, I'm going to be a part of that. But Jesus doesn't turn to him and say, I'm so glad you finally figured it out. Let's go take over. What he tells Peter and what he tells his disciples is, don't tell anyone what you've discovered. Don't tell anybody that I'm the Messiah. And not only does he say that, he then starts teaching them that the Messiah, this promised king, this promised savior, that is going to make Israel the greatest in the world, he needs to be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, all the religious rulers of the Jews. He needs to be rejected by them. He needs to suffer many things. And he needs to be killed and on the third day rise again. And Peter, because he's imagining this great revolution and this great kingdom, he's so shocked by this, he turns to tell Jesus, and he basically like yells at him like, Don't say that! What are you saying? That's not what happens to the Messiah. What happens to the Messiah is he takes over. And if he's going to take over... He has to get the support of the people. And if he's going to get the support of the people, he needs the support of the leaders of the people. So don't say that you're going to be rejected by the elders. That doesn't make any sense. And you might know how Jesus responded. He said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me because your mind is set not on the things of God. Your mind is set on the things of man. Just like a chapter later, Jesus does this again. He starts teaching them that the Son of Man, the Messiah, needs to be rejected and killed. And this time, the disciples don't say anything because they're confused and they're scared. It doesn't make any sense to them what he's saying. So the question is, what happened? Like I said, two surprising things in the passage. One, Peter is calling these Gentiles God's chosen people. And he's also saying Jesus was a living stone rejected by men. Somehow this idea that Peter could not accept, now it's in his own mouth. This idea that the Messiah should be rejected and was rejected, Peter is now using this idea to encourage people. And what happened? How did he go through this transformation in his viewpoint? Just 
as Jesus predicted, he was rejected. Eventually, there came a time that he was brought before the council of elders. And the elders tried him, and they rejected him. And they decided, we need to get rid of this guy. And they delivered him over to the Roman authorities, the Gentile rulers, and the Roman authorities crucified Jesus. So what Jesus said came true. He was rejected by the elders. But he wasn't only rejected by the elders. Peter, the one who said, that can't happen, you can't be rejected, Peter himself rejected Jesus. While Jesus was before the council, while he was before the elders, Jesus was, I'm sorry, Peter was outside in the courtyard. While Jesus was being spit on, while he was being beaten, while he was having all sorts of false accusations leveled against him, Peter was outside and he was so scared that he denied even knowing Jesus. Not once, not twice, but three times he denied knowing Jesus. So Jesus was rejected not only by the Gentile rulers, not only by the Jewish religious leaders, he was rejected even by his followers. At the end, he was left all alone. And part of why this happened is to show us that if we were there, we too would have rejected him. There was no category of man that did not reject Jesus. Jesus was left completely alone. In this rejection, whether it was through pride like the religious leaders or through fear like Jesus' disciples, what all of these people proved is that they were out of touch with God's plan. They were out of step with God's plan. They were disobedient. And now remember what God said to the Israelites through Moses in Exodus. He said, if you will indeed obey my voice. There is a condition on God's promises. If you will obey my voice, you shall be my treasured possession. If you obey my voice, you will become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation and my chosen people. But what everybody proved in the rejection of Jesus is that they were not obedient to God's voice. Israel had been disobedient all along. They were disobedient in the time of Moses. They were disobedient in the time of Isaiah. And they were disobedient in the time of Jesus. Jesus was the only obedient Israelite. Jesus was the only obedient one. And what he proved through his obedience was this. The chosen people of God actually just had one member. And this holy nation, it actually only had one citizen. And God's treasured possession was one person alone, his one and only son. <coughs> so if that's true, if Jesus, if Jesus was God's treasured possession, why did he get rejected? Why did he suffer so much? Why did he die? How does that make sense? And how did Peter eventually accept that and embrace that and decide to use that to encourage others? God was not failing Jesus when Jesus was rejected. Actually, God had a much bigger plan, and he had called Jesus, obey me. No matter how hard it is for you, obey me so that my plan can be accomplished. And because Jesus was obedient, he did obey. And what happened when Jesus was rejected, when he suffered, when he was killed, God, mysteriously, in a way that's beyond our comprehension, was reconciling the world to himself. 
And Peter came to embrace that because he realized that if Jesus hadn't been rejected, if Jesus hadn't died, then someone like him, someone that could deny Jesus while Jesus is being beaten and spit upon, could never be reconciled to God. And he said, I don't have any hope apart from this rejection. And so he embraced the rejection of the Messiah. The story didn't end at that point. It didn't end with Jesus' death. It didn't end with three dark days of hopelessness. God raised Jesus from the dead. And part of what this tells us is when we obey, when we love God and we become his prized possession and we are chosen by him, nothing can change that, not even death. At Pentecost, which it's actually the anniversary of Pentecost today, we celebrate Pentecost today, Peter preached that God raised Jesus from the dead. He delivered him from the pains of death because death could not hold him. God raises Jesus from the dead. And so Peter doesn't say, you come to a stone rejected by men. He says, you come to a living stone rejected by men. And because Jesus is alive, because he's not dead, all of the promises that God made to Israel, God can now pour onto him. Jesus obeyed, and God promised blessings for obedience. And because Jesus is alive, God has already begun to pour all of these promised blessings on him. And he's continuing to pour these blessings on him, and he will pour these blessings on him forever. But God was not pleased to keep it at Jesus. He wanted to explode that. He wanted to make that huge. And the plan he's chosen is that anybody who puts their trust in Jesus, anybody who chooses to build their life on Jesus and becomes tied up with him, becomes associated with him, now becomes the true Israel of God. Look, study through the New Testament, and you'll see that Jew and Gentile are called Israel. Jesus is the true Israel, and when we put our trust in Him, we gain all the benefits that He earned by His obedience. So because Jesus is chosen, we are chosen. And because Jesus is holy, we are holy. And because Jesus is treasured and precious, we are treasured and precious. Look at what it says in verse 6. Peter is quoting the prophets, for it stands in Scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. Like I said at the beginning, the main point here is the character of our lives and our destiny is all determined by what we do with Jesus. And if we trust in Him, even if we're rejected by everyone, we will not be put to shame. And all of the blessings promised to Israel that Jesus gained will be poured upon us. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, disobeying the word as they were set to do. I'm just going to say it again. What we do with Jesus, it determines our destiny. In the journey of life, everybody encounters him. There comes a time that we encounter this living stone, and God, in His patience, He gives us an opportunity to examine this stone, to look at it, to check it. And if we choose, we can build 
our lives on Him. Jesus can become our foundation. And if He becomes our foundation, like I said, though rejected by everyone, you will not be put to shame. You are chosen by God. You are precious to Him. And you're chosen for the great privilege and responsibility of declaring His excellence. Of declaring that He's delivered you from darkness and brought you into light. And what a privilege that is. But for everyone who's distracted by a dream, for every gaze that's fixed on some illusion, Jesus, the living stone, is just an obstruction. Jesus is just an obstacle in the path. And even though God is patient, He might allow you to get around that stone now, or to jump over that stone now. There's going to come a time that you won't be able to avoid this living stone. And your disobedience today will destine you not only to stumble over this stone, but to fall. And this is the choice before each of us today. You might think, oh, I'm already building my life on Him, but this is a daily thing. Do you choose today to build on Jesus? This man, rejected by men, but chosen and precious to God. Or do you choose to look for a foundation elsewhere? And while you race off to find another foundation, no, you destine yourself to stumble and fall. This is a choice we all need to make today. This is a choice we all need to make tomorrow. I just want to end by reading through this passage. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble disobeying, disobeying the word as they were set to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the life that you lived, for this obedient life that you lived. We praise you for that. And we thank you for suffering and dying on our behalf. You lived the life that we should have lived, and you died the death that we should have died. You did that all for us. And we thank you, God, for your mercy. That by putting our trust in you, we can gain what we don't deserve, all of these promised blessings. We thank you for that, God. Make it realer and realer to us. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.